Good morning, everyone. It's Wednesday, April 22nd, and I uh, invite you into the classroom in my living room. I'd like to read through Chapter 7 with you and discuss it. The most important theme in this chapter has to do with uh, Stop Thief's developing identity, and we know that he lacks, you know, he lacks a stable identity, a stable and secure identity at a time when, according to the Nazis, having a certain identity of being a Jew or a gypsy would definitely mean death. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's start with chapter seven, and I'll read it and discuss it, and uh, you, know, you can follow along. Page 25. Those were the good times, our icebox, our cellar shelves were full of food. We ate peaches and brandy and peanut butter and caviar sandwiches. We ate apples and lemon danish and cheese puffs and hickory smoked drought. We ate candy all day long. My favorite was a buttercream with a hazelnut inside. There was usually only one to a box and often not even that. And I was not good at telling them on sight. So I broke open chocolates by the hundreds searching for my prize. I raced through candy shops, tossing boxes into a sack, and raced out to the usual chorus of, Stop! Thief! At home, I frantically dug for hazelnut buttercreams, flinging the rest aside. Yuri scolded me for wasting, except for the candy. He made me finish eating everything I started. As for Yuri, he loved pickles, big, fat, juicy pickles. They floated in barrels of brine and in grocery stores. The urge would strike him suddenly. He would pop up, Let's go! Pickle run! We went on many pickle runs because Yuri would eat only fresh pickles. If a pickle had been out of the brine more than a day, he stuck his nose up at it. This meant we had to keep finding new stores. No one would ever, no one ever saw him take anything, but after a while a grocer would begin to notice that whenever a certain red-haired boy came into, the, came into the store, pickles disappeared. On the way to a pickle place, I was not allowed to snatch anything. Yuri did not want his pickle run spoiled by a snatch and run of mine. But on the way, as he contentedly ate his prize, I, will, I was allowed to do as I wished. Yuri usually took things from store shelves and counters, except for candy I took from people. We would be strolling along, pickle juice from Yuri's chin, spattering the sidewalk when I would see something and take it. Off I went weaving through the crowds of people while Yuri munched away, pretending he didn't know me. Back home, he would say, how do you do that? I would shrug. I just do it. You're amazing, he would say. And I would feel like a buttercream with a hazelnut heart. Sometimes Yuri went out alone. Scouting, he called it. He told me to stay put. One time, I did not stay put. It was not long after the jackboots came. I got it into my head to go to the Grand Boulevard and see the parade again. That's what I believed. The parade was never ending. It went on day and night, and I was missing it. I climbed out of the cellar and started running. But when I came to the Grand Boulevard, there was no parade. There were streetcars and automobiles and people upon people, but no parade. I saw two jackboots walking. I ran up to them. Where's the parade? The tall one laughed. You're five days late. It's over. I tried to understand. Are the tanks gone? Not gone. Yuri says you hate me, I told them, but I don't believe him. Good. I want to be a jackboot someday. The tall one said something to the other, but I could not understand the words. He reached down and ran his fingers through my short hair. Someday, little dark boy. Are you a Jew? No, I said, I'm a gypsy. Are you a Jew? Again, he smiled and said something to the other, who did not smile. Let's hope not, he said, and they walked on. So, of course, this is very important. Um, there's a sense of um, desperation here. Um, the Nazi soldiers obviously know what is in, what's in store for the Jewish people. Um, the other important point in this section is stop thieves' childhood innocence, not, not understanding that jackboots are dangerous and not understanding that, um, you know, wanting to be a jackboot is definitely uh, something that, that, is, that is terrible. Okay, I saw a lady carrying cream puffs. Don't ask me how I knew they were cream puffs. It was a white pastry box like any other, wrapped in a white string. I just had a sense about those things. Maybe it came from snatching food for as long as I could remember. I was coming up behind her. She wore a red coat as the air was chilly. The seams of her stockings were perfect black lines running from her heels to the hem of the coat. Her blonde hair spilled from a little black hat. The pastry box dangled from one hand. 
She was not a screamer. Not everyone was. After I snatched the box, I heard no screams behind me. No footsteps either. She was not a chaser. Still, I ran. I always ran. I did not know how not to run. That was my life. I snatched. I ran. I ate. So I was running, chased by myself, you might say, and I turned a corner and was suddenly flat on my back. I had run into someone, a boy with one arm. Gypsy, he cried. My cream puffs, I cried. They were scattered about the sidewalk. So were his cherry turnovers. He reached over for a cream puff and threw it at my face. I threw one at him. We laughed and scooped vanilla cream puff filling from our cheeks and ate it. We scooped vanilla filling and cherry goop from the sidewalk. And what we didn't eat, we flung at each other. And in between, we fell on our backs and laughed. Walkers veered into the street to avoid us. Well, well, came a voice. Little thieves. It was a jackboot grinning down at us and we were gone, fast as flies. One arm, one way, me another, the jackboots, laughter, fading. I ran down, <clears throat> excuse me, I ran down alleyways. I didn't recognize where I was, but it didn't matter. I was in the city, the only world I knew. So of course, we know that this is not true, that um, he's eight years old. He did have a whole other life before we opened the book. He was somebody's child. He was a member of a a community. He had parents. He had a family. And um, that memory is, you know, is erased. I came to a garden. Some people had little gardens in their backyards. The gardens were all brown stalks and stubble and fallen leaves by now. And so this this was one, except for the tiny upshoot of green and red. It was a tomato plant, probably the last surviving one of the season. I knew something of seasons, but nothing of months and years. I had no use for them. I know now that this must have happened in the month of October in the year 1939. Okay, so this is very important. This is something that Jerry Spinelli uh, does in all of his books. He weaves in these little, um, these little changes in perspective and changes in time. When he says, I know now, that's the voice of Stop Thief as a much older person, uh, an older man who obviously survived the Warsaw Ghetto, looking back at this experience and saying, yes, at that moment, at that time when I went into that yard and I stole the last tomato plant in Warsaw, um, it was 1939. And he also uses that voice in the first chapter on page one when he says, sometimes it is a dream, sometimes it is a memory in the middle of the day as I stir iced tea or wait for soup to heat. So again, this is one of Jerry Spinelli's stylistic hallmarks um, that, um, you know, he's giving us a clue here. Stop Thief survived. And he's an older man now and he's looking back. And, um, and in, his, in his daytime reveries, um, as he's making tea or making soup, he has this memory of running in the same way that uh, he remembered the tomato. So let's look for that as we read the book together. Many green tomatoes dangled from the vine and two plump red ripe red ones. I was still hungry. I pulled off a red tomato, sat myself down cross-legged on the ground and ate it. The juice spilled on my chin as pickle juice often did on Yuri. I picked off the other tomato. As I was eating it, I turned my eyes toward the back of the house. Someone was sitting on the step, a little girl watching me. I never ate with someone watching me unless it was Yuri or the boys. Eating came after running, and yet I didn't move. I sat there and ate the last red tomato in the city, and I watched her watching me. <clears throat> her elbows were on her knees, and her face leaned into her cupped hands. Her hair was curly in the other a bread crust. Her eyes were brown as chestnuts. They were very big. When I finished eating the tomato, I stood and walked off. I didn't run. When I looked back, she was still watching me. Her round, unblinking eyes made me feel as if I had just become visible, as if I had never been seen before. When I was far from the backyard, I kept looking back. When I told Yuri I found two red tomatoes and ate them, he didn't believe me. Okay, so um, that's the end of this section. The next section is the beginning of his second identity. So let's see what happens here. On the first day that the light went out, Yuri said to me, okay, this is who you are. Your name is Misha Pilsudski. So at this moment in time, this is one of the precious, precious, wonderful things that Yuri gives him. He gives him the gift of a past. And remember, um, this idea of uh, life and death in the circle of life um, is, is taking place here. This is the death of 
um, of Stop Thief and the rebirth of Misha Pilsudski. And he told me the rest. I, Misha Pilsudski, was born a gypsy somewhere in the land of Russia. My family, including two young grandfathers and a great-great-grandmother who was 109 years old, traveled from place to place in seven wagons pulled by 14 horses. There were 19 more horses trailing the wagons as my father was a horse trader. My mother told fortunes with cards. She could look at cards and tell you how you were going to die. She would look into your eyes and tell you the name of the person you would marry. Every night the wagon stopped in a grove of trees by a stream. The chores of us little children were to gather sticks for the fire and feed the horses. My favorite horse was a speckled mare called Greta. Every night, one of the brothers hoisted me onto Greta's back and I pretended to ride. I had seven brothers and five sisters. I was not the youngest, but I was the smallest. I was so small because I was once cursed by a tinker who did not like the fortune my mother gave him. Since we were gypsies, we belonged everywhere, so we came to the land of Poland. My father traded many horses. My mother told many fortunes. Then we were bombed by a jackboot airplane. The war had not yet started. Jackboot airplanes were simply flying about practicing for the war. The jackboot general told the pilots that they could practice on Jews and gypsies. So when a jackboot pilot saw a seven wagon full of gypsies, he immediately dropped his bombs on us plus his goggles and everything in his pockets. So although this is a made up story, it sounds very likely. Uh, this is probably what happened to our young protagonist. Fortunately, we looked up and saw everything coming down and we scattered seven wagons in seven directions. I was with my mother and father. They were sad, but I was not because Greta, my favorite horse, was with us. Then one night, as we were camped in a grove of trees, some Polish farmers who hated gypsies even more than jackboots hated Jews came with torches and tied up my mother and father and stole me and Greta. So again, I think this is um, this is probably um, probably you know some part of this is actually what happened to him. Uh, there was a bombing, the family scattered, and um, somehow he was separated from his family. For a long time, Greta and I were slaves for the farmers. They fed us nothing but turnips and pig's milk. Then one night, Greta broke out of her stall and ran away. The next day I ran away too. I searched and searched for Greta and my family all over Poland. Finally, I came to the city of Warsaw where I learned to steal food to keep from starving. So this young boy, seven or eight years old, has this wonderful imagination and it's this imagination, you know, that kind of keeps him alive. Um, it keeps him alive during the Warsaw Ghetto. And um, for whatever part of this um, speaks to the truth, um, I think this fantasy um, is in part um, accurate. I never saw Greta or my parents or my brother or sisters again. And so thanks to Yuri in a cellar beneath a barbershop somewhere in Warsaw, Poland in the autumn of year 1939, I was born, you might say, with one detail missing. I waggled my Yellowstone, this is Yellowstone, he wears on the leather, on the leather cord. What about this? He stared. Yes, it was your father's. He gave it to you. I was greedy. And what else? Before you were kidnapped, he said. That's all. I loved my story. No sooner did I hear the words than I became my story. I loved myself. For days afterward, I did little else but stare into the barbershop mirror, fascinated by the face that stared back, Misha Pilsudski. I kept saying, Misha Pilsudski, Misha Pilsudski. And then it was no longer enough to stare at myself and repeat my name to myself. I needed to tell someone else. I think Jerry Spinelli meant to do this. Um, there was a man, actually, by the name of Joseph, Josef Pilsudski. He was born in Lithuania, and he died in Warsaw in 1935, which is um, two years after uh, the Nazis uh, bombed Poland. He, uh, he was a leader in Polish history. He was a leader of Polish independence. And so I think what Jerry Spinelli is trying to do here is kind of marry two ideas. This idea of Joseph, Joseph, who was Yuri's younger brother's name, and the idea of Pilsudski, this, this statesman, this very uh, notable person who fought for uh, the independence of, of Poland. And that's who our stop thief, our main character, is. Um, that's his evolution. That's who he is now. He's kind of a combination of uh, Yuri's younger brother in his memory and um, carrying forward the memory of this great man.
Okay, so that's the end of chapter seven. So this week we are studying five, six, and seven, the uh, evolution of Stop Thief's identity, and now he has become Misha Pilsudski. All right, have a great day, and um, hope to see you soon.